So first of all, welcome everyone. I'm Justin Wang, Advocacy Manager for Greenbelt Alliance. And thank you so much for joining our Climate Leaders webinar. This is a series highlighting climate leaders working on issues related to making our world more resilient. In case this is your first time joining us, Greenbelt Alliance is a nonprofit organization based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And our mission is to educate, advocate, and collaborate to make the Bay Area's lands and communities more resilient to a changing climate. Before we start, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for making time to join us for a conversation today. Today has been so challenging and our hearts go out to the friends and family of those affected by the VTA shooting today in San Jose. Joining me today is Dr. Nusha Ajami. She is the Director of Urban Water Policy at Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. Nusha is a leading expert in sustainable water resource management, water policy, and the water food, energy food nexus. She studies the human and policy dimensions of urban water and hydrologic systems. Dr. Ajami served as a gubernatorial appointee to the Bay Area Regional Water Quality Control Board, try saying that three times fast, and is currently a mayoral appointee to the SF Public Utilities Commission. She received her PhD in civil and environmental engineering from UC Irvine, an, uh, an MS in hydrology and water resource from the University of Arizona. So getting to the meat of this, we're here today to discuss a hot topic at the moment, which is the Bay Area's drought. As many of us have noticed, the past two years have been remarkably dry. The driest two years since 1976 uh, and 1977, in fact. So as of May 20th, sections of Marin, Sonoma, Napa, Solano, Contra Costa, and Alameda counties have all been in the exceptional drought category. The rest of the Bay Area is in the extreme category, which is just one level below the exceptional category. Yet even as reservoirs are shrinking, fire danger is rising, and water supplies are looking more tenuous, the need for more housing is clear. Spurs regional strategy calls out the need for 2.2 million more housing units by 2070. In the South Bay, Greenbelt Alliance has been working diligently with peer organizations and local residents to ensure that we are putting those housing units in the right places. Just last night, there were two huge wins for the region. In San Jose, Downtown West, which will produce 4,000 homes along with hundreds of millions of dollars in community benefits, was approved unanimously by the City Council. In Sunnyvale, the City Council voted to study up to 20,000 new housing units in their Moffat Park specific plan area. This is, uh, which would represent an over one third increase in the total number of housing units uh, in the entire city of Sunnyvale, which is incredible. What's important about these decisions is not that it's more housing, but it's the right housing. Both will provide homes next to jobs and transit, supporting our region's goals around vehicles, miles traveled, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and providing benefits and efficiencies around our usage of utilities, precisely like water. So now that I'm, you know, done with my monologue, let's get let's get into why we're all here, of course, which is our conversation with Nusha. And I'd love to, love to just open up with uh, a question about some context. You know, why why are we currently facing this drought again in the Bay Area? Is this something that we can expect to be our new normal? Thank you so much, Justin. Really appreciate being here, and I also want to. Um, to say this was, has been a definitely a difficult day and I'm, um, I appreciate whoever is attending and I want everybody to know that our hearts are with the families that are impacted. Um, why are we in this again? We had, uh, we had extreme droughts uh, between 2012 and 16, uh, had a normal year and a wet year and then back at it again. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, the, this year is the sort of second driest year uh, in the past hundred years. And, um, you know, it's interesting to kind of look at the data and where we are in the drought. I was looking at the data since the 2000, I was looking and we only have had four wet years, 20 years and only four years that we have had, um, you know, we have gone above normal, actually, I should say we have gone above normal, not even wet year, above normal. Which, and the rest of those years have been either dry extremely dry, moderately dry, or we have been in a drought. So, um, so I guess this is this uh, sort of calls for a question of what is it, what is a drought? Because often as soon as a drought starts, everybody sort of panics as if this is something that rarely ever happens. And we start like, uh, you know, trying to kind of catch up with the limitations that we have. But the reality is you're experiencing more dry years than, than wet years. 
And uh, this is actually, so while it's getting worse and worse because of climate change, the, if you look at the past hundred years as well, you still see 60% of the years that we have been in, uh, we have um, been in a sort of like a either dry or um, uh, below normal dry or uh, extremely dry years. So this is, I would say, we have to shift our mindset. We have to think about droughts as a normal thing. Mm -hmm. And then when we have wet years, we have to actually think about how we can use those opportunities to be more strategic about where and how we save water and where and how we store water uh, to make sure we have enough for those dry years, which are normal in California. Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting reframing of it. Um, and yeah, it, it seems like it's, you know, th these these wet years and the dry years, water, it just seems like it's very feast or famine. You know, it's like, I, I think I was reading that uh, some of, I believe in Southern California, that they find they get about like 30% of their yearly water uh, within six, like a 60 hour span or something, you know, it's these really extreme water events that come in. And, you know, if, and if you don't get those, then then you're just kind of still out of luck for that year. So, so it's really, really interesting uh, the way that you framed that. So I'm kind of curious, you know, what is it that you're studying at Stanford? You know, what, what are the things that you're focusing on right now to kind of address these ebbs and flows in our, in our water supply? So we have a few studies that uh, focuses on issues around demand, actually. We, we really believe in my team that uh, trying to understand how demand is evolving is key in helping us to plan for future supplies, especially as we, as we are experiencing drier and um, uh, hotter years. Um, so uh, some of the issues around that is like, you know, what are, what are the demand trends? Are, be, are people using the same amount they used to do, use? As population is growing, is the drown, drown, demand is also growing in the same way. Um, I have also colleagues who are working on groundwater issues, which are mm. quite important for California. Uh, on a normal years, we use about 30% of our water supplies comes from groundwater uh, resources. And in uh, uh, dry years and drought periods, that number goes to up to 70%. So it is extremely important for us to understand uh, how groundwater basins um, work, uh, how we can make, you know, use, use that water sustainably, uh, how we can recharge some of those groundwater basins during these wet, uh, wet years. Um, so um, lots of interesting studies there. And also some of the other work that my team is doing focuses on development, like what kind of development do we need as we are facing drier and um, as you're facing more scarce water conditions uh, and what kind of information do we need to use to build these future communities yeah yeah that's really that's interesting and i think some of the, the yeah something that you said really struck with me which is you know like focusing on demand versus supply where you know i think you know we're always you know in the news, you see the really striking pictures of like the empty reservoirs or, you know, and all that and the aquifers depleting. And actually, you know, what, what you said reminded me of some of the work that we've been doing around Coyote Valley for years, you know, us and our partners, which is, you know, obviously it, it helps recharge, you know, the largest aquifer for, for Santa Clara County. And it's so critical to protect these open spaces. And it's just, it's fascinating to me how, how interconnected everything is, right? You know, like we, Absolutely. one person can care about Coyote Valley just for the recreational and open space or agricultural reasons. But in doing so, they're actually act they're actually also protecting our water supply and even you know pre doing preventing us from building within high wildfire risk zones. Like as you said, you know things are drying out. We're more prone to wildfires. You know these are all there's so many intersecting climate hazards here. You know so so drought is just kind of symptomatic of of so many other things that we need to watch out for. And I think that's that's something that we should all we should all keep in mind. Absolutely. Um, so I'm you know what. Uh, broadly speaking, you know, what kind of strategies do you think we should be focusing on it to make us more resilient in the long term? You know, are there certain things that are that are standing out to you as things that are, you know, must use for our region or for our municipalities? Sure. I think just going back to the demand conversation, I think just shifting our mindsets from, you know, how you're talking about shifting my mindsets from, wet, you know, droughts being a yeah. normal thing rather than uh, being in a, you know, once in a lifetime event, we should actually also shift our mindsets from supply oriented approach that we have to demand oriented approach. Often when people talk about droughts, the first reaction to your point is how much, is, how is it impacting our supplies? But the reality is actually demand is quite dynamic. And we have seen in the past 20, 30 years that at least in California, our population has grown significantly, almost doubled 
but our water use haven't really increased much or actually have been in some areas have been decreasing. Uh, which means that we have still we have been able to grow within the existing pie that we have, and I would say we still have so much more inefficiencies in that pie that we potentially can fit in another twenty million in there by um, not necessarily growing, you know, impacting our water supplies or taking more water out of the system. Um, but that requires a really good strategy. We have to be better better at managing yeah. water. We have to be better at managing uh, leaks. We have to be able at, to, we have to become more efficient in the way uh, we uh, move water around. We have to build homes that are more efficient. We have to have less grass. It's really important. I mean, one of the, one of the important things that we have been studying just past year was, uh, you know, a, the, this data is not from our group, but we found this uh, done by NASA uh, that uh, about uh, most of uh, we use more water for grass in the U.S. than we use water for corn. And think about it: we don't even wow. eat grass, right? <laughs> we just use it as a, a, you know for be for beauty and uh, yeah, you making throw the ball around. Nice. <laughs> exactly. So, so you know, there are so many other strategies we have to put in place to be better at demand management and reducing demand as much as we can before we start thinking about okay, so what is supply then? When you think about supply as part of resiliency, then it comes down to what, how we can create this circular system. Water mm. is a very precious resource. We should not be bringing it to our homes or our businesses, using it once and discarding it. We have to use it as many times as we can. Uh, the fact that we flush down our toilets, uh, precious clean water is, is really, really not a good idea. So how do we create more circular water systems that uses water more efficiently and multiple times? Um, and um, so increasing water recycling and reuse is also really key. And I think another piece that you also mentioned, which is very key as part of building resiliency is how we can work with nature rather mm. than using our 20th century approach of sort of conquering nature to to enhance our water supplies and to actually deal with uh, climate challenges that we have from wildfires to water quality issues to water availability issues. And also the fact that our, uh, you know, working with nature and, uh, you know, building more nature-based solutions can help our communities to become more, you know, have a, have a nicer spaces, uh, have a better social spaces, and also uh, basically dealing with our, um, you know, temperature rises and um, reducing emissions and energy efficiency. Yeah, that that really really resonates. You know, just places like downtown West. You know, where where money where the investments are being made, and we're seeing these investments being made. You know, just better stormwater capture and rain gardens and green infrastructure, where you're really getting these you know these multi benefit solutions, right? Like you know you get the stormwater gardens and or the stormwater capture and like the the rainwater gardens, and it's you know it's capturing the water and it's providing that benefit, but it's also just beautifying the space. You know, people that are out you know taking their kids for a walk or, or just enjoying the downtown. You know, there, there's been tons of studies around, you know, the, the mental health benefits of having Absolutely. green space as well, you know, mitigating the urban heat island effect. Uh, you know, I'm sure we've all felt, you know, the need to turn on AC every now and then, you know, the last few summers, it's been getting awfully hot. So, yeah, it's just really exciting that, you know, how, how closely water intersects with all these other things uh, that are important Absolutely. to us in our communities. Absolutely. Um, one thing I know that you've, you know, you've done some work with Google on some of their campuses and, you know, I, I've, I've chatted with them you know, they've been doing some dual plumbing and I know that they have a really, really innovative system at their Bayview campus, I believe, where they're using geopiles to kind of, I think they've reduced the, the water usage by 80%, you know, that would traditionally be used for, for heating and cooling. And, you know, which is a tremendous savings in water, millions of gallons a year. And I, I wonder if you had any, you know, any insight about, you know, the scalability or, you know, what you see as the future of those systems, because it seems like, you know, this is really new territory right now. It's being, it's being Absolutely. pioneered by just a few. Absolutely. Um, I think you touched on it. You have a few campuses, um, you know, Google, Facebook and Apple, they have been trying to sort of create, do more water reuse and try to reduce their water footprint as they're developing their new campuses. And I think I would say that's a great model for every new development that we have. It should, we should make sure that future development focuses on reducing our water footprint, um, either, either by 
doing things internally as you're building by creating circular systems to make sure water is used more efficiently, to make sure you have uh, dual plumbing, you make sure that you reuse within on site um, to make sure that we are not flushing down there our toilet, precious uh, drinkable water. Um, and also we are not using uh, high quality water or um, like, you know, uh, uh, too much water for outdoor spaces. Um, but also it's, uh, the, the second thing is it's also very, very important as you're sort of developing these new campuses. It's also focusing on not only reducing your own water footprint, but potentially providing incentives for some of these new development to go around and work with some of the other communities that might not have the resources to implement some of these solutions and potentially providing incentives for them to go and work with these communities to do uh, to do more uh, to become more efficient. So I think um, you know all of the above needs to be as part of our toolbox and um, and it's key to uh, I think regional collaboration is going to be the only way we as a region and any region can survive these. Um, um, uh, continuous water stresses that we are going through. And that last bit, it sounds like, you know, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say on this, but it sounds like you're about to dive into justice and equity, right? You know, like we're talking like these benefits that we're creating, these amenities, you know, who's benefiting? Is it people yes. that are already, you know, well-resourced? You know, because obviously on our work, we want to make sure that we're addressing our frontline communities. We're making sure that they're also reaping the benefits of this climate resilience that we're working to build. So I'd love to hear, you know, your insight on that as well. That's a very, very important point, and uh, and it is definitely at the heart of some of the work we are doing. I would say there are again two two top two issues there. One is who is going to help some of the low income communities or disadvantaged communities to be able to kind of bring them on board and help them to be as efficient in the way they use water. They have access to the best technologies available. They can um, they can have systems that work. The second thing, the second piece of that is, um, you know, as we are building these, for example, all these campuses that are putting on you reuse systems or doing things on site to become much more efficient or reduce the water um, uh, water use uh, footprint. Um, you know, th th some of this is happening in an ad hoc way ba base. So different groups are doing it in different places. Now, at the same time, water utilities are sitting down and planning for the future. This is how the population is growing and we potentially need this much water. So we should be doing X, Y, Z uh, to, you know, build out our system to be able to meet future demand. And, um, and I'd say two things there. One is what we have seen over time is again, as I, I'm reiterating this because it's so important, population growth is, has been decoupled by, uh, uh, from water demand growth. And the second thing is if they are building these systems and all this new development is also doing more to become less, have less water footprint, all of a sudden you may leave some infrastructure behind, some stranded asset that needs to be paid by communities that might not have the resources to be yeah. off-site, off the grid, right? No. Or, or partially off the grid. So I think we should be very strategic in the way we do, we do development because we don't wanna end up over-investing in solutions that might end up costing us a lot of money to maintain and operate and leave this legacy, some of our legacy infrastructure, as well as these stranded assets for communities that don't deserve to be left behind to pay for them. Yeah, yeah, that's a really, yeah, that's a great point. You know, this double-edged sword of building this infrastructure where we need to make sure that, you know, we're not passing the buck over to, to communities that, you know, that are already struggling. That's, that's a really uh, insightful point. And so, one, one, one quick thing, Justin, there, I think uh, sometimes it's very difficult for people to imagine how water, uh, sort of these distributed systems in water work. And I always mm -hmm. often remind people, think about solar panels on your roofs or on different, different people's roof. The same thing can happen with water, these on-site reuse systems, let it be on a campus or being on a single bin building. It's basically generating water or reusing water multiple times within the same uh, location. So it's basically similar concept uh, when yeah. you think about it. Yeah, no, I, I remember, you know, I'll go on a bike ride and I'll, you know, I, I live in Sunnyvale, so I, there's plenty of Google properties for me to go around and I'll see some of the signs where, you know, I think the, the Microsoft campus is also doing some really exciting things uh, with water. And I'll, and I'll see the sign saying, you know, like, don't drink the, the water that's being, you know, that we're using to, to water the plants with. There's a bunch of, they have, they have a lot of like, every like five feet you see one, they, they really want to make sure you don't drink it. 
And, you know, and the first time I saw it, I was thinking, I was like, you know, why does that need to be said? I just assumed that was the case. And then I looked into it and, you know, really we use potable water for, for, you know, like, as you said, literally flushing our toilets for everything. Yes, and it's just, and it seems so incredibly waste. You know, we're, we're literally flushing it down the toilet, you know, which it's funny. It's a euphemism, you know, we'll say we're like flushing money down the toilet. In this case, we're literally flushing, you know, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's so yes. crazy. That we-, we are not only flushing money down the toilet, we are flushing re- a precious resource down the toilet when it's not even, it should not be. I mean, the, the problem is development, right? The way we, mm-hmm. the mindset that we had in the 20th century, again, as I said, it, it was very much of a once true system right it comes in it was centralized and once true and the utility was managing this whole process and we put mm-hmm. all these things in buckets now we are learning that actually this is not the most efficient way of managing such a precious resource and we need to be a lot more mindful and that means that customers will be at the heart of these transitions right mm-hmm. if google is deciding to do things or microsoft or uh, facebook or buildings in San Francisco that are required to put on-site reuse, you know, they are actually becoming not only the consumer of water, but also producer of water, right? Yeah. So we are seeing this transition that customers are sort of becoming, uh, uh, this terminology a colleague of mine and I use, prosumers. So you are producers <laughs> and a consumer at the same time. So, um, so it is a very interesting and exciting time for water, but also we have to be very strategic and thoughtful in the way we are making this transition happen because we don't want to have negative consequences yeah, socially absolutely. or environmentally. Absolutely. So, you know, with all this being said, what are, do you have any, you know, great examples in the Bay Area of, you know, what are the places that we should be paying attention to for, for water availability? You know, what are, what are in your mind, you know, like the top three or, or whatever high priority places? Sure. I mean, I would say, look, uh, if you look around the Bay Area, you see a lot of different interesting projects that are happening. Um, Obviously, you know, I live in San Francisco and I, um, you know, uh, I have a big affinity with the city. So um, so I would say, you know, our on-site reuse program is a very, very exciting program because it sort of has this opportunity to demonstrate how this can be done in a high density areas. Um, that you know, people can. Uh, that this is a requirement. Every new uh, large building, uh, 250,000 square foot or foot or more, needs to have an on-site reuse system for the flush for the for toilet flushing and also outdoor water use. Um, there's also a, a green infrastructure projects, uh, various green infrastructure projects going on around the bay, uh, across you know north south uh, um, as you go from uh, you know. Uh, San Francisco to all the way to San Jose that you can see all the way around people a lot of these green infrastructure projects are being installed um, in different cities uh, in, for various reasons some for dealing with stormwater capture and stormwater quality issues mm-hmm. um, and some is actually beautification which also have alternative uh, benefits uh, as well uh, sort of auxiliary benefits I would say, you know, the work that these campuses are doing are super exciting because, again, they have the opportunity to demonstrate how this can be done. And um, and that is really exciting. Um, and um, so that, you know, I, I definitely uh, um, I'm, I'm really excited about that. I would say a lot of the work that's going on around the Bay uh, yeah. uh, with uh, with some of the, you know, uh, horizontal levees and, uh, you know, the uh, trying to kind of manage um, the, some of the negative in- water quality impacts of our stormwater. Um, it's, it is quite exciting. Uh, so a lot of exciting things happening around yeah. the Bay. I, you know, I can, I can go on and on and on and <laughs> talk about it. I, mean, I think we are doing a lot of things. H- having said that, a long way to go for sure. Yeah. That, I, I believe it. And the horse, you know, you said horizontal levees and my eyes, lit, you know, like in Sunnyvale, I live in Sunnyvale, like I said, and, you know, horizontal levees, you know, we're obviously sea level rise something that we're very concerned with. And, sure. you know, horizontal levees, it seems like a great way to, you know, to address kind of the needs to, to kind of mitigate for, you know, sea level rise while also providing habitat. And, you know, this Absolutely. kind of goes, again, you know, this, this multi-benefit solution to these climate crises that we're facing. Um, so another I, multi-benefit project. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I think that's the name of the game, you know, and I think, yes, absolutely. you know, it was, before, like you said, in the 20th century, it was all about trying to conquer nature, you know, fighting with nature, and I think it's so exciting that we're really finding ways to unlock this synergy with nature, you know, how can we work with it to achieve the, the, the benefits that we need? Absolutely, and have less footprint, for sure. Yes, so it is 528, and I do want to make sure our folks in the chat have 
an opportunity to get some of their questions answered. I'm seeing, uh, let's see, I'm gonna to go to the Q&A box. The first one that I see is one from Lynn. Uh, I, this one, this is about ag water use. I know you're focused on urban water use, but I'll throw it to you anyways. Um, so she says that ag water demand uses 70% for crops that feed cows. So which crops should California farmers be planting? Uh, and then also there's a need to en uh, enhance our, I'm assuming consumption of plant-based foods as well. Yeah, this is, this always comes up. Um, definitely ag, um, you know, consumes more water than uh, urban areas. We do actually work in the intersection of ag and urban as well. Um, I would say, um, you know, the, the problem is for the longest time, we also focused on um, transitioning from low value crops to high value crops. Uh, which is now uh, the name of the game, almonds and orchards and nuts and, um, you know, uh, some of the fruits that we grow. And, and I think obviously they're much more high, highly valued, but the problem with those kind of crops is that they are permanent crops, which means that no matter what kind of a year you have, dry or wet, you need water for these, uh, for these crops and you have to water those trees to maintain them. Um, so that means that during the dry years, which some of these other like row crop growers could, you know, let their land go fallow for a couple of years as you we were experiencing the drought, we don't have that flexibility anymore with these high um, value crops, with some of these high value crops. Uh, but, you know, I think that the question that uh, really sort of connects land use and water use is very, very important. We should definitely at some point tackle that in California. It should not be sort of like a uh, free for all. Everybody can grow whatever they want, but um, currently we are not doing that. And, um, and you know, eventually as a state, we might, um, um, I mean, we are right now in a crisis. Honestly, we have a lot of groundwater that has been uh, mined and used and we have some, uh, you know, uh, really, uh, we have a lot of groundwater basins that are in critical conditions. So. Um, so I'm not sure how often, how much more we can go on uh, putting so much demand on our groundwater basins. So um, it's a huge issue. And I'm sorry, I don't have a, a silver bullet kind of an answer for you, but I think it's a very important issue that we have to focus on. One, one, one last comment on that issue I would say is, remember agriculture often grows what we want to eat or use. So we also as consumers need to think about how we can reduce our waste and, and water footprint by being more mindful of uh, our, you know, how much food we waste or how much what we eat. And uh, I know that's a topic for a different day, but, you know, just, just touching on that as well. Yeah, thanks Lynn for the, the, the question and thank you for the answer, uh, Misha. So another question, this is a, just a quick one. Uh, what is a horizontal levy? Sure. So basically horizontal levy, you know how uh, old, old school levees, they would uh, sort of work as a uh, sort of a wall, right? It stopped the water from coming in. They were not as flexible and they were sort of like it would go uh, vertically. These horizontal levees are actually are a combination of, and I'm no expert in horizontal levees, but are a combination of marshlands and various ecosystems that goes, as, starts on the land and goes into the bay and basically gradually allows for the, for creating a buffer zone that not only stops from water from coming in, uh, but also provides an opportunity to kind of clean the water as it moves, uh, as it uh, goes, uh, leaves the land. Um, so they're basically, instead of having seawalls, think about them as being horizontally, gradually um, uh, starting from a high ground and gradually going down and creating a, a sort of transitional space to manage water and floods. Great. Uh, another question from Remy, uh, or yeah, another question. When will buildings that have purple pipes installed per code, per code be required to actually use recycled water to flush toilets, et cetera? That's a great question. So it's, it, is, it is one of those questions that often comes up because, you know, we, in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, we definitely put a lot of investment in purple pipes. And I think there are some, uh, we right now have a few, um, one major recycling plant uh, in the Bay Area that's, um, that is uh, trying to provide recycled water to various communities. And some of these major um, uh, campuses 
um, especially in the Redwood Shores, are using that water to, for their outdoor spaces. Um, uh, especially the city of Redwood City, we worked with city of Redwood City uh, for a few of our projects. So we know they have a number of customers that are using that recycled water. Um, now, uh, there is a little bit of a transition happening. Uh, not only we are bringing them, not only that water is sort of being trying to be distributed through Pebble Pipe, there's also this transition of not putting purple pipes, but actually promoting more of these on-site reuse systems. Um, depending on where you live, different communities are promoting different things and trying to kind of um, um, deal with um, water recycling in different ways. So, um, so I don't have the timeline and I don't know where you live, but I think, I think at some point, hopefully some of that water will make it through different household houses. And the next one is a bit of a doozy, I think. So we'll, we'll see how much time we have left. But Joe is asking, uh, I think this is kind of, I'll just, I'll just read it. How does the building and occupying of Google's 20,000 person village use less water than the 200 people that occupied that space before? The concrete alone would use way more water. So I think asking you know, about the questions of efficiencies and the economies of scale here. Yeah, sure. So first of all, I Absolutely. If you're thinking about building a campus or any any kind of construction, obviously it's going to use a lot of water. And and I don't think that's what that's the water we are talking about right now. We're talking about like as the residences come in and land in their space, how much water footprint do they have? And you know, you would be surprised. We actually looked at the um, so just to give an example, not the Google campus, but I'm giving you an example in the Bay Area. We looked at uh, Redwood City as an example of how people are using water. We looked at the new development that's closer to the Bay and some of the old development that's up on the hills. And we, we looked at the water use of different customers. And what you see is these new buildings that are closer to the Bay, because they're newer, they have been built much more efficiently. They have smaller outdoor spaces. Uh, they, um, they use a lot less water. They use less water than some of the small houses in some of the low income communities in that area. Just, and these people are, the population is still as much. They're, you, they're, you know, they're, the houses have, you know, these are families. So they're not like one person or two people. We're talking about four or five people living in these houses. And they're uh, sort of, the footprint of the house is pretty big. So they're not small houses either. So just to give you a sense of how these new developments can be quite efficient. There are actually some activities going on, not in the Bay Area, but this other company, European company trying to build these homes or communities that are actually individual homes or offices that are using about 50 liter per day. So just imagine how little that is. Um, so it's kind of like trying to kind of put this to, into perspective of how, how far we can go if we, focus on efficiency and trying to build these communities that are, um, and that are not as, as high demanding in water. Great, thanks for that, yeah, that very thorough answer. So just as we're coming to close, just maybe one or two more questions. Sure. One from Julia, uh, she's asking, is there a way to dual use household water as a tenant, given that you're not able to change your own plumbing? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I don't think so. Unless your landlord probably allows you. And I, I tell you one, one thing, uh, you know, we as in California have a huge issue with multifamily homes and also metering. And then that goes down to what Julia is asking as well. The reason I'm bringing it up. We don't, we don't have meters on sub meters on people's water use. So if you're living in a building, you Either you are not paying for your water bill or you're paying a share of your water bill without necessarily knowing how much water you're using. Um, this is really in a way that in 21st century, we use such an important resource this way is ridiculous in many ways. But so if we are not, if the new development should be much better at that. And I think, Julia, I don't think, I don't know if you live in a single family or a multifamily uh, place, but there's no real simple way of being able to reuse water um, unless you basically get a permit and have, an, have a permission from your landlord. So um, I've seen some smart, creative ways people do these things, but I'm not, you know, I, I'm not, I'm no plumber and I can't really promote any of those, but um, I wish it was easier. 
and it should be easier. And hopefully, um, you know, I think I always say use droughts as an opportunity. Um, potentially, this can be an opportunity for us to transition to a more better way of thinking around how much how we use water. Awesome. And I think to, to close this out, one final question from Stephen, and I think sure. this is a really great, great way to close this out. You know, are there things we can do for individual residences? You know, what can we as individuals do uh, to, you know, whether it's, you know, whether it's what we can do with our own properties or even uh, what we're advocating for, you know, what do we need to, what conversations do we need to be a part of? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, look, as individuals, we all can play a huge role. Don't believe when they say your individual action doesn't matter. We, uh, we did a study, again, I'm going to talk about this because I think it's very important. In the, in the previous drought, when the governor asked people to use less water, and you, uh, we saw all these news articles being written on the drought and the severity of drought in California, what we saw was people of California reduced their water use about 20 to 25 percent without even being required to do it, right? It wasn't a mandatory restrictions put in place. So we as individuals collectively can really have it, can do a lot. Um, don't, um, you know, um, keep your water open as you're brushing your teeth. Don't turn on the water as you're using your uh, garbage disposal, take sh uh, shorter showers, collect the water sh shower water and use it for flushing down toilets. Outdoor water use, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to reduce our outdoor water use and not use that much water outdoors. Um, again, you can use, collect your shower water and use it for outdoor spaces. Um, you know, collect rainwater. If you know, if you live in an individual household, you potentially in some areas can think about uh, installing gray water systems. Um, it is important. You should try to do that. I think uh, you know. I, I saw someone in chat mentioning to Julia that talk to your landlord. I think you should definitely feel like you 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 should be able to express these things. Um, I think as individuals. We also can ask our utilities, can you meter us? Can we have a better sense of how much water we use if you're living in a multi-unit building? Um, so we, there's so much we can do. And then also I would say a lot of different habits that we have needs to change the way we, um, uh, again, I don't want to go down to the food side, but you know, reducing our waste, reducing you know, the amount of um, uh, like meats that we eat, the amount of, you know, um, some uh, dependence that we have on some of the high water footprint um, products. Um, so those are all really, really important issue. And also, I leave you one last thing. Remember, every drop of water that's wasted or polluted is a drop of water that we call, that is, you know, that's, um, uh, that's a precious water that we have lost. Right. So we have to be very mindful to make sure we don't pollute water either. And that is another thing that's really key because polluted water is a water that we can't use for consumption. So we have to also pay attention how we protect our water bodies by and uh, not using herbicides and pesticides, not, um, you know, uh, uh, putting anything that's not good into our water system in any ways or means. Uh, um, protecting our water system from trash. Um, I can go on and on and on, but yeah, you know, I think yeah. there's so many different things one can do. No, I, I wish I, question. I wish we had hours with you, uh, Dr. Azami. Like truly this has been, it's been an amazing, amazing webinar. So, you know, my, I, my deepest thanks, I know I speak for myself, the rest of my green belt and the, all the audience for, you know, when I, when I say thank you for joining us today. Um, yeah, so me. I really appreciate that. And for, you know, for the rest of our audience members, if you had friends who want to join but weren't able to, um, which of which I'm sure you had many, this talk was recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. So just to, as, as one final plug for Greenbelt, you know, the work that we do to protect the Bay Area's natural and working lands while also creating thriving communities is made possible by you. So please feel free to donate today, which you could do securely on our website at greenbelt.org slash donate. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about our organization, please check out our website. So again, huge thanks to, to Nushta here and to the rest of everyone else for, for attending, uh, especially given the, the really tragic and somber events of today. So, so thanks again.